I'm going to share something with you tonight, and I have full intentions of completing this message in its entirety tonight. And yet I have quite a bit of material for you. We have a key scripture, and that is Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12, that says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I could speak all night on that one verse, but I have a lot of other verses I want to share with you. That's a rich verse. And Brother Hagin, um, Jesus appeared to Brother Hagin and put those in an order um, of, 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 of authority. In other words, the spiritual wickedness in high places, he said, you don't need to be concerned about that. You don't deal with them. He said, uh, you remember where Daniel said I was, um, Michael was Israel's prince, Michael the archangel, and he said, the prince of Persia withstood me. I heard you the first day, but 21 days later, he got the answer through. And um, so those are things that the, the angels deal with. And uh, some of these smaller ones, uh, Stephen, if you can, put that back up there, and let's just leave it up there for just a second. I wanted to, to talk about it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. They are, if, if I'm not mistaken, they're the little imps. Uh, liken them unto gnats and mosquitoes and irritable stuff. Powers, maybe these are the, the rats and uh, maybe even some uh, monkeys and, and kind of thing. And then the rulers of the darkness of this world, that would be like a wild boar maybe out in the jungle. I'm just, I'm just giving you an idea of size-wise. A lot of the things we think are so tough, they're just sand spurs. You know, um, Second Corinthians two eleven. We should know our enemy, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. You got to know who your enemy is. Stop dealing with flesh and blood. You know, one of the things I didn't mention. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. In in Ephesians six twelve again, the word wrestle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Almost gives you the impression that you're down on the floor. Because when we see people in high school wrestling, you know, they're down there really going for it. And, uh, but W.E. Vine's New Testament uh, Dictionary of New Testament Words shows that that word means rest. W-R-E-S-T. Like you try to rest somebody. Or actually another word for it is vibrate. The devil's trying to sway you. I, I said rest. I didn't mean that. I meant sway. To try to sway you off the word. The only fight that we're supposed to fight is the good fight of faith. That means God says something, and the devil says, like he did with Adam and Eve, hath God said? Let's talk about it. Never have an audience with the devil. Everything he says is deception and deceit. So, I want us to look at um, all the places in the New Testament that deal with war or warfare. Not one time does it ever have anything to do with the devil. We're not warring against the devil. We don't fight the devil because Jesus already conquered him. In... Um, Colossians 2.15, it says, having, that's past tense, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus paraded the demons down Main Street. That's the way it was when a king conquered another king. They took the captives and paraded them down Main Street naked. Um, one of, I guess one of my most favorite is Hebrews 2.14 and 15. For as much as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, that's us, he also himself, that's Jesus, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, we'll come back to that word, might destroy him who had power of death, that is the devil, and, who, um, and um, deliver them, who, where am I? Took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
Go to verse 15. So Jesus came and took on flesh so he could die. God can't die. But Jesus came and took on a body so that he could lay his life down and take it up again. So he didn't do it for himself because he didn't need it. He did it for us because we desperately needed it. We were lost and undone without hope, couldn't save ourselves, and Jesus loved us so much, he came and took our place. Now this word, um, let's back up to verse 14. Deliver the, de, um, he said, for as much then as the children are protected the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil. Well, did Jesus destroy the devil? Yes, but it didn't say he was going to annihilate him. He didn't say he wouldn't exist anymore. That word in the Greek, uh, let me tell you how Rotherham's translation translates it as paralyze the devil. The Amplified translates it as bring to naught and make of none effect. Bring to naught, N-O-U-G-H-T, and make of none effect the devil. Christians get hurt all the time because of the devil. They're running from him. And they bump into things, skin their knees, stumble, bump their head. But the devil can't hurt you unless you give him power to hurt you. Unless he yells and you jump. Unless he lies to you and you believe it. So he'll sit on your shoulder and speak things into your ear. And if you listen to him and act on those, he wins. It's like the little guy... Uh, who, who was it? Ratatouille? Remember Ratatouille sitting in the hat of the chef? Okay, it, it's like the demon speaking into people's ears, saying, you're no good, you can't do anything, nobody likes you. And he, they, if they believe that, then they cower back when they had authority to come in and be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So they're crippled because of their thinking. There are three great enemies that Christians deal with. And the greatest enemy is wrong thinking, wrong believing, and wrong talking. If your thinking is wrong, then your believing will be wrong. Now, I'm trying to think of an illustration, but we've all seen situations where people thought something was one way, but it wasn't. And because they believed that it was, they wouldn't touch it. I'll give you an example. They took a cage full of monkeys and they put let's see if I can remember how this goes now they put a thing of bananas in there and when one of the monkeys would go to get the bananas they would spray him with a water hose real hard water um, I think what it was it had one one monkey and every time that monkey would go for the bananas they'd spray him with a water hose so then they put another monkey in there. Well, the other monkey wanted the banana, so he goes to get the banana, and the first monkey grabs him and stops him. And then they keep adding them. And there's only one that was sprayed with the water, but after they get a whole cage full, but none of them would touch the bananas because every time one's added, all the others pull him back. No, don't touch the banana. We become desensitized. We become blinded. Because the devil has conned someone, and that someone begins to con others. You can't do anything. You're no good. Oh, who do you think you are? Jesus Christ? Well, no, we're not exactly, but he gave us the power of attorney to use his name. He said the works that he did will do also. He said all things are under his feet. He's the head of the church, and, and, and he put all things under his feet. So in a sense... Um, Actually, he said in John 10, 34 and 35, you're God than whomsoever the word of God has come and the scripture cannot be broken. The power is in the word. Jesus is the living word. Well, you can become part of that living word. Jesus, in the beginning, John 1, 1, in the beginning, um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was the light, life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness can't overcome it. Then the light became flesh and dwelt among us. The word, the word, the light, the salt, 
Jesus, God, became flesh, dwelt among us. And uh, that's verse 14. And then, um, again, Jesus said in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And in Romans 8, 29, uh, Whom he did foreknow, we also did predestinate, or foreordain, to be conformed to the image of his Son. I'm sorry, Stephen, none of these are on the list I gave you, but... Um, to, to be conformed to the image of his son. We're supposed to be like Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Hebrews 2.10 says he brought many sons unto glory. He was the firstborn of many brethren. He was the firstborn. And then came you and me. Are you with me? He, 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 he led many sons unto glory. Jesus came and gave his life, and now everyone that's born again through the power of the Holy Spirit, can do what he did. Because Jesus didn't do any of those things because he was God. He was God, but he didn't do the miracles because he was God. He did the miracles because he was Christ. You'll read in the Gospel of John, sort of, he says he did these things, and he said, if you don't believe me, um, believe me for the work's sake. Well, he's saying he's the Messiah. He's the one that was coming. But the Messiah didn't do those works in his own ability. He did those works because he was anointed. He was anointed of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 61, 1. And then over in Luke 4, 18, and Jesus told Brother Hagin in a vision, he said, um, I preached that message everywhere I went. And when he stood up in, um, I think he was there, I'm not sure where he was. Uh, we could probably back up a few verses, but don't bother right now. Um, but wherever it was that Jesus was speaking, he told Brother Hagin, he said, I didn't just speak that there. He said, that was my first message I preached everywhere I went. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. See, he's quoting Isaiah 61. He's saying, I am he. In other words, he's the Messiah. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's what he wants us to do to continue on that work. And the devil wants to say, who do you think you are? Ooh, 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 I'm glad you asked. But see, I, I, I'm getting, I'm getting, I, I have to be careful if I'm going to preach my message. But, but in uh, Luke 16, 16, where it, it talks about John the Baptist, and um, it said the kingdom, since John, the law and the prophets were until John, since that time, uh, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. But let's back up to 15. All right, go 14. We may have to go to 17. Okay, forget it. You remember Jesus said concerning John the Baptist, you'll find this also in Matthew 12. Oh, my. Anyway, 16, 16, somebody help me. Where is it in Matthew? Don't worry about it. You remember the scripture where Jesus said, since John the Baptist, he said there's none born of, of women greater than John the Baptist. Do you remember that? Yeah. But he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Ooh, See, we've been born again. We're in the kingdom. People who were saved and died earlier, they're in the kingdom too on the other side. We're still in the kingdom down here. And you can tell which kingdom you're in, whether you're in the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light, by whose will you do. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 10, what we call the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In his kingdom, his will is done. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. I like that. I like that. Okay, we are an occupying army. In Luke 19, 13, Jesus said, occupy until I come. So we are an occupying army. Not in a, bidle, a battle, uh, we enforce the victory that's already been won. Jesus defeated the devil. Um, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came and conquered the devil for us. Now, let me see a couple things I want to give you. The, the words, I'm going to give you this point first, because I, I want to tell you where I'm going. First Timothy 6.12. Genuine spiritual warfare has to do mostly with the mind and the flesh. 
the mind and the flesh and fighting the good fight of faith. Spiritual warfare is not fighting the devil. I looked up in my 26 translation uh, different scriptures concerning this um, uh, to, to sway us away, to uh, fight the good fight, to uh, wrestle in, in Ephesians 6, 12, that word wrestle. And a lot of them said to struggle. What, what it's saying is that in New American Standard uses the struggle. There, there, there's a struggle to live for God on this earth. But the struggle isn't really with, it is with the devil in one sense, but he doesn't have power over you. And we, we use those two scriptures, particularly Hebrews 2.14, but also Colossians uh, 2.15. And another one that I really like is Colossians 1.13. Um, having, uh, Colossians 1.13. How's it go? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness hath delivered us, already delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom of his own dear son. So the devil is not your problem. We don't fight sin because Jesus is the cure for sin. Hebrews 9, 26. He is, um, Hebrews 9, 26. For, um, Put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. For then must we have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So we're not, we're not fighting sin. We're not fighting the devil because he's already been whipped. And we're not supposed to be fighting one another. The only fight we're supposed to be in is 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of Zoe. So the biggest problem we have is with the mind. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, 4, and 5, he says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. If you will pay attention, you'll find that there's a lot of Christians worn after the flesh. You're probably one of them, but you may not be. If you war after the flesh, you're going to be defeated. <laughs> so, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. There are so many people warring after the flesh. They're trying to live for God in their own strength, their own ability, and it's a gift. He's already done it. We, 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 we make such a big issue out of passing out tracts and doing personal work when in reality, we ought to break and in, uh, interrupt ourselves in our song as we walk down the street singing and praising God and, 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 and say, oh, excuse me, Lord, let me give a track to this poor dear soul. Then we stop to talk to Let me share this track with you. I was down at Mercedes today. I had a little problem with my car kind of thing. Was, that's why I was late for prayer. By the way, you're all invited to prayer on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. I mean, come as soon as you can. I know everybody can't be here, but come as soon as you can. We really appreciate you. I came in late tonight because of, of that. But when I gave the, the mechanic the track, he, he, he remembered me, and I'd already given him one, and I said, take another one. <laughs> it's just fun. It's just fun witnessing to people, and the work's already done. Amen. But the devil wants you to shake in your boots. He wants, he wants you to think that they're going to re reject you. But, and sometimes people do. But you know when they do, I jump back so fast, I think it, they can almost feel the vacuum. If somebody doesn't want, if I go to give them a track or something, and they say, I, I, I got a friend that's looking for cars right now and stuff. He's in the business, sort of. He's starting it. He's a preacher. Anyway, he, he, interesting, some of these big older cars, and there was some, one on the way home. I stopped, and the guy came out. I don't know if he was a... I, I wondered if he was a Jehovah's Witness pastor or something. But he knew who I was. But when I went to give him the track, he just stood there like he wouldn't move his hands or anything to take it. And I just stood there talking to him with the track right there until he took it. I'm not intimidated. But I want to tell you something. I didn't start there. I didn't start there. I was shaking in my boots when I first started passing out tracks. But after a while, you find out they're the ones that's thirsty, not you. You got the answer. 
Okay, I am going to go through this now. Uh, now, I want to tell you something else first. The word wrestle in vines means to sway. So, the devil's trying to sway us out of faith and into doubt and unbelief. Romans 3, 3 and 4 says, what if some did not believe? Does their unbelief make the faith of God of none effect or without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar as it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So, just as an example, if 1 Peter 2.23 says, By his stripes ye were healed, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, that's a powerful one, isn't it? Being dead to sins, <laughs> it's all through Romans 6, by the way. Dead to sin, I'm dead to sin. Whoa, praise God, I'm dead to sin. That's the most wonderful thing. When I was a young Christian, I didn't know that, and the devil led me around like a pig with a ring in his nose. You know, and I was constantly tempted here and tempted there, and I was just miserable until I found out I'm freed from sin. I got a new nature. I'm a spirit man. I live in a body and possess a soul. My spirit's been recreated. Old things have passed away. All things become new. I am dead to sin. I'll never enjoy sin again. That makes it easy not to do a lot of it. Being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes she were healed. Well, if the Bible says that I was healed, then I am healed. Now, the question is, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the devil? Are you going to believe the doctor? Are you going to believe your friends and peers and loved ones that say, oh, no. Be careful. This is serious. A friend of mine said that one time. They were casting out the devil out of this guy. And I said, I, I, I just said, well, you know, we used to wrestle with people, get down, hold them down, cast the devil out of them and all that for a long time until finally they go, Ugh, and the devil comes out. You know. I said, but Jesus didn't do it that way. In, um, um, in, in, uh, Matthew 8, 16, he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophets, saying, himself took our infirmities and by our sickness. Well, if he took them, I don't need to take them, and by his stripes I'm healed. The question is, whose report will you believe? Well, you got to understand now, this doctor has a lot of accolades. Buddy, he's been to this school and that. The question is, are you going to believe the doctor or Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm just using the healing thing as an example. There's a whole Bible there that covers every spectrum of life. We are called word of faith. That's, we're not Baptist. We're not Assembly of God. We're not Lutheran. We're word of faith. What does that mean? It means we believe the Bible... More than we believe what you can see, hear, touch, taste, or smell. We believe the Bible more than we believe the senses. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by the word of faith, which Paul said in Romans 10, 8, that he preaches. The word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Word of faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's how you get faith. And so when we talk about the word of faith, we could say this. We could shorten it and say we walk by the word and not by sight. But if you'll notice in Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's also not, it's the, it's the evidence of things not heard or smelt or felt. In other words, faith is spiritual and it's of the heart. It doesn't have anything to do with the sense realm. If you're going to walk or live by faith, you must leave the realm of the senses. 
That's a quote from Fred Price, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. If you're going to live by faith or walk by faith, you've got to leave the realm of the senses. So 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight. You could say we walk by the word and not by the senses. So we are word of faith. That means we believe Jesus. He's the word. More than we believe what we see here, touch, taste, or smell. More than we believe what we see here, touch, see, hear, hear. Faith comes by hearing. Faith also leaveth by hearing. Scripture says, take heed what you hear. Another place says, take heed how you hear. Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. I really don't have time. But could we go to, to, to Mark 4, 24 in the Amplified? I think we shared this Sunday morning. Tell me if we did. He said unto them, be careful what you're hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. And more besides will be given to you who hear. Worth its weight in gold. More so. Far more so. Okay, are you ready? War and warfare in the epistles. The words devil or Satan are never used in connection with the words war or warfare. The words devil or Satan are never used in connection with the words war or warfare. We're not warring against the devil. He's already defeated. We're not trying to fight a defeated foe. People waste a lot of time and energy fighting a defeated devil. Jesus said in Matthew 28, uh, Matthew um, 28, 18, all power is given unto me, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. How much does that leave for the devil? None. None. Jesus said the devil's a liar. I learned that if you'll tell him that, you, you know, there's so many people, so many Christians, please hear me. They love God with all their heart. And I, oh, uh, I got a thought. I want to tell you this story, but I want to make sure I finish my thought. There's so many people, they just love Jesus and they sing to him and they, and, and they, and they just love him, crawl up in his lap and just pet me, Jesus. And, and it's wonderful, great, wonderful relationship. But when the devil comes in to eat your lunch, you need to not be talking to Jesus at that point. You need to turn and address the devil and tell him he's a liar and to get out. When Jesus was talking to Brother Hagin in a vision and a demon came and interrupted, and Jesus, uh, Brother Hagin just couldn't understand why Jesus didn't do something about it. He kept thinking, I can hear Jesus, but I'm not understanding what he's saying. And he kept wondering, why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he do something? Finally, he just got frustrated and said to the demon, Stop it in Jesus' name and, and, and get out, you know. And then Jesus said to Brother Hagin, if you hadn't done that, I couldn't have. And, and Brother Hagin said, Lord, <laughs> I know I misunderstood you. I, it sounded like you said you couldn't have, but I know you, you must have said you wouldn't have. And Jesus said, no, you heard me right. I couldn't have. Well, Brother Hagin, that, he, it just floored him. He said to Jesus, he said, I've read my New Testament. This is 1950. I've read my New Testament over 150 times, and I don't know anything like that in the Bible. And he said, though I see you standing here talking to me, I can't receive that unless you give me at least two or three New Testament scriptures because 2 Corinthians 12, 1, or 13, 1 says in, 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 two, uh, in, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Jesus smiled at him. He said, don't, don't ever be, uh, feel, feel intimidated when you're wanting to be a stickler for the word. He said, Jesus smiled at me. He wants you to be a stickler for the word. Because if you don't stand with the word, you're going to fall. It's just a matter of time. So, so he told Jesus, he said, I, I don't know any place in the Bible that it supports anything like that. And Jesus, and he said, you'll have to give me two or three New Testament scriptures. And Jesus said, I'll do you one better than that. I'll give you four. And I don't remember which ones that they were, but I'll give you a few and you'll know that the four were in that because there's more than four. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. 
Well, he's not going to flee if, he, if you don't have power over him. So you have power over him. In 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, um, um, Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So you couldn't resist him if you didn't have power over him. And then uh, uh, 1 John 4, 4, He that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. And, uh, and uh, Mark 16, uh, 17, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They'll cast out devils. Couldn't cast them out if you didn't have power over them. Um, Luke 10, 19, behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall be enemies hurt you. Uh, Mike, we were talking about this the other day. You have any more? I, I think I gave you a few more. What? Ephesians 4, 27, uh, neither give place to the devil. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Okay, I need to move along. There's others. Look up any of those and get your study Bible with little footnotes and they'll, they'll give you others. In 1 Corinthians 9, 7, it's talking about ministers should be adequately paid. It says, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? That's not talking about fighting the devil. Are you with me? Okay, we're looking at scriptures that use the word war or warfare, and I'm showing you that they don't have anything to do with the devil. We're not fighting the devil. Jesus already took care of the devil. If the devil comes up and causes you a problem, don't turn to God and say, help me, help me. He's already helped you. Don't ask God to do what he's already done. Don't ask God to do what he's told you to do. Don't come to God and say, do something about the devil because he's not going to do it. He's done all he's going to do about the devil until Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1 where one angel with one hand takes the devil and throws him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Okay. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4, and 5. We covered that, but I didn't, uh, we didn't cover it, but we touched on it. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and reasonings. You say, my Bible doesn't say reasonings. If you study the word out in the Greek, go to Vines or some of these other translations, you're going to find out that reasonings are, in, are a part of that. It, it's just explaining you're casting down imaginations, and imaginations have to do with reasonings. It's, it's how the devil tries to talk people out of trusting Jesus. But let every man be a liar and God be, be true. I did finish that, didn't I, in, in Romans 3, 3 and 4? As it is written, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar that thou mayest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. The doctor says you're going to die. And I say, Jesus says I'm going to live. And so you die and you go to heaven and they say, well, what happened? And you say, I don't know, it ain't my problem. I stood on the word. Heaven and earth pass away, but God's word never pass away. Jesus looks over and says, I like that. You come over here and sit with me. You're the only one I ever failed. <laughs> Think on that just a little bit. Side with Jesus, you'll never be wrong. I know it's a little, little, little twisted there, but if he lied about it, he's going to make it up to you. Did he lie about it? No. no. You know what happens? In uh, Revelation 12, 11, this bothered me. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And I said, Lord, I never, almost never, almost never, once in a long, long, but almost never do I ever read after someone who quotes that whole verse in its entirety. They always leave off the love not their lives unto the death. Now, I've seen it once or twice. But this Friday, I will have been a Christian 48 years, and once or twice ain't much. Okay? I have almost never seen it when I'm reading somebody's book and they're preaching and teaching and they quote this verse and they spell it out in the, in the book and they say, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And that's dot, dot, dot is what you find. Dot, dot, dot. They leave off and they love not their lives or death. So I asked the Lord one time and I, sa I said, 
I, what does that mean? I said, I never see anybody say, I said, I think the reason that they don't put that in print is probably, I mean, it's, it's a suppositional on my part, but probably because they don't know what it means either. So I asked the Lord what it meant. And this is what I feel. I didn't hear the Lord speak to me, it's under for heaven, or even speak on the inside of him very clearly. But this is the impression I got when I was asking God, what does that mean? And it was that they give up too quickly. They quit too soon. If they'd go to the wire, trust in Jesus, if they'd say, I don't care what the, 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 the x-ray says, I don't care what the doctor says, I don't care what anybody says, the Bible says, by his stripes you were healed, and I'm going to say what God says. Get right down the end. Did you? Oh, I don't have time. I, I, I'd love to talk to you more. And, and Lord willing, next Wednesday we'll talk about some things, but I'd kind of like to finish something. So I'm wanting to finish this. So did I go all the way through 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4, and 5, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and reasonings and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought under the obedience of Christ. That's the good fight of faith. That's the spiritual warfare. The devil's trying to sway you your loved ones, well-meaning people, people who really are good people and they want what's best for you, but they don't realize what they're doing when they say, I know, I know, but this is serious. This, 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 I was telling you about the preacher that was telling me, you know, about the demon thing. They had a guy in his church and he was throwing chairs around. I mean, throwing chairs around, picking up these, these uh, metal chairs and, and throwing them and stuff. And it was a big deal, you know. And, I, and uh, they tackled him. All the ushers tackled him and everything. And I said, you know, you, I didn't come on like Mr. Prophet or nothing, but we were friends and we were talking and I just said, Jesus cast out spirits with his word. You know, he said, but this was serious. <laughs> I know he didn't, he didn't know what he was saying there, but man, when it gets serious, you better believe Jesus. Okay, 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. This charge I commit unto thee, son, Timothy. You find Paul saying things like that a lot. I charge you, I command you, you know. And today it's so different. Anyway, I charge, I com, I, um, this charge I commit unto thee, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Let's just look at that in a New American Standard real quick. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you might fight the good fight of faith. And 19, maybe real fast, we'll just look at it. That was my main point. Keeping faith in a good conscience, which some having rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Um, some have rejected and suffered shipwreck. It's the battleground's in your mind. The work's been done. The job's been accomplished. Yeah. Jesus said it's finished. Yeah. Yeah. I've got about like eight minutes. Second Timothy 2, 3 and 4. You know our calling is 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 1 says be strong in the grace. And 2 Timothy 2, commit to the faithful. And 2 Timothy 3, uh, 2, 3, that thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not a chocolate soldier that melts when it gets hot. <laughs> Do a hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And so this has nothing to do with the devil. It's saying there's a price to pay, stay committed. Isn't it? Not dealing with the devil. The devil's defeated. James 4. I'll tell you what. We're gonna, uh, let's do 1 through 4. Let's do 1 through 4. James. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Go to verse 2. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. I want to give you two more verses before I make comment. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. 
You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship, that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. When's the last time you heard that verse preached in church? Okay, um, the word war in James 4, 1 through 1 and 2 actually, the word war is used to describe the results of unrestrained fleshly activities and it has nothing to do with the devil. Isn't that true? Okay, that was weak, but thank you for those two. 1 Peter 2.11, Peter uses the word war to describe battle between lust of, of flesh and soul, the mind, will, and emotions, just as James did, as we just read. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. No mention of the devil. Romans 7.23, but I see another law in my members, body or flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, body. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. The battle's in your mind. The devil says, oh, you're sick. You're real sick. Don't you feel bad? And your mind says, yeah, I do. But listen, thoughts will come, and thoughts may persist in staying. But thoughts not put into words die unborn. Now, remember when we started, we talked about three things. The greatest enemy is wrong thinking, wrong believing, and wrong talking. If your thinking's wrong, then your believing will be wrong. And if your believing's wrong, then your talking will be wrong. And whatever you say, that's what you get. We have what we say. Mark eleven twenty three: 23, whosoever shall say shall have whatsoever he saith. Actually, I'm doing pretty good. And so, 1 Timothy 6, 12, as we said already a number of times, genuine spiritual warfare has to do mostly with the mind and the flesh and fighting the good fight of faith. One loses by trying to get what you already have, like Adam and Eve did, trying to become like God, instead of believing that they have what the Word says they have. The words war and warfare primarily have to do with putting the flesh under and controlling your thought life. It's a work of the flesh to try to do it in your own strength. It's a work of the flesh. I mean, it, reasoning will puff you up because of that. But in reality, it's unbelief. Actually, trying to save yourself by works, you want to say to the person, who do you think you are? I mean, if, you know, when you know the scriptures, who do you think you are? To think that something in you, your own ability, is worth anything, really? It's not worth anything. We, our, we, have, we have no self-worth. We no no worth, I should, to, to approach God to say you're sorry. You're, you, one sin's all it takes, and we've been sinning from the beginning. Yeah. It's really not about sin. It's about the sin nature. Yeah. You can't exist in heaven as much as God wants you there. He wants you there so much, he sent Jesus and said, you must be born again. Well, how do you do that? You climb the highest mountain. You swim the deepest sea. No, you believe. You believe and receive. And healing is a part of salvation. It's already done. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be fighting one fight and only one fight. And that's a good fight of faith that says, if God said it, I believe it. And that settles it. Now, you know, Brother Hagin's the one that said that. And somebody tried to improve on it one time and they said, God said it and that settles it. No, 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 no. That's the world in which we live. Everybody wants to take themselves out of the equation and say, it's not that I lost it, it's just that it got lost. 
No responsibility. No ownership. No, all things are possible to him that believeth. That means all things are not possible for everybody because everybody will not believe, but those who will believe, all things are possible. So you can't take you out of the equation. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Woo! Glory be to God. Woo! Ha, <laughs> ha, Bow your heads with me, please. You say, preacher, I'm not right with God, but I want to get right with God. Please don't embarrass me, but just pray for me. Would you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, just slip your hand up so I can see you. I won't embarrass you. I'm not going to call you down front or anything like that. Just want to pray for you. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Father, I pray that you will forgive this person. You can put your hand down now. Forgive them of all their sins. Help them to come into a relationship with you by surrendering their heart and opening up to your word and your will and that, that you'll come in and recreate their spirit and help them know according to your word that 1 John 5, 13 says we can know that we've passed from death into life. We can know that we have eternal life. And so, Lord, as they confess with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord, next time they get opportunity for them to tell someone that Jesus is their Lord, let them sense that new life inside. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, and God bless you.